I'm very pleased to introduce Discovering Your Indomitable Spirit. Ralph Bernishka was a third season, Ralph Bernishka's third season as a place kicker in the NFL was cut short when he collapsed on a cross country team flight battling, while well, battling um, ulcerative colitis. He would undergo two emergency surgeries within six days and his life would hang in the balance for six weeks um, while he remained in intensive care. After surviving, he made a miraculous comeback to play seven more seasons with the San Diego Chargers, becoming the first player ever to wear an ostomy bag in the NFL. He would earn numerous honors, including being named the Walter Payton NFL Man of the Year and NFL Comeback Player of the Year, play in the Pro Bowl, and be inducted into the Chargers Hall of Fame. Following his NFL career, Ralph became, Ralph became CEO of Legacy Health Strategies, a patient engagement company, and founded the Grateful Patient Project. He recently created Alive and Kicking, a recovery program for ostomy patients. He's also a respected leader and speaker in the healthcare industry and works tirelessly as a patient advocate who is active in supporting leg legislation that encourages research and innovation and protects patients. Ralph enjoys working with organizations that have a heart for patients like UCSD Health, the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation, San Diego Blood Bank, the Oli Foundation, and, and numerous other charities. He takes time out of his busy set, um, schedule to connect personally with patients who need encouragement, um, especially those with inflammatory bowel disease. He's recently founded the Rolf Bernischka Legacy Foundation, and the, he's been the author of three books, including his autobiography, Alive and Kicking. He's been married for 28 years to the love of his life, Mary. They have four children, three of whom have special needs. So with that, let's hear from Ralph. Great, thanks, thanks, Joan. Hi, everybody. It's, it's, uh, it's a little awkward being virtual, but I appreciate your taking the time to get on the Zoom and listen in and uh, be part of the whole Oli Foundation movement. Thank you. It's hard to watch that video. That was a lot of years ago, but it always ends the same way. I keep missing that first field goal and got to relive that slow, long walk to the sideline, wondering what the future is going to be like. But who would know it would turn into what it was? In many ways, that part of my life was a bad chapter in an amazing story, and I'll share some of that with you. Um, first of all, I really appreciate the chance to be here and to share that. Um, as you saw, I was a, a football player, never intended to be a football player. I was raised in a medical uh, academic family. My dad was a medical school teacher in Boston where I was born, and then he moved us to Dartmouth when I was five, lived there till I was 15, and then one day out of the blue after being pretty entrenched in the New England lifestyle where I was a hockey player, skier, tennis player, soccer player. He announced without uh, asking us kids that we're moving to San Diego. This was 1970, right after the, the, the 60s. And we were from a conservative little town in New England and suddenly moving to the wild, wild west of California. Didn't know a person. Uh, but that would, would change our lives on a lot of fronts. Um, my dad joined the faculty at UC San Diego Medical School helped grow that medical school that launched a biotech community here in San Diego. He uh, got very involved with the zoo, started the research center at the San Diego Zoo. His life was always sort of around this academic medicine, very curious guy. Uh, the move did one thing for me, which ultimately is why I'm sitting here. Because in California, soccer is played in the winter, not in the fall, like it is back east, where it would always butt against football, and I would always have been a soccer player. Out here, soccer in high school is played in the winter. So we actually started a soccer team my junior year, and that was just when soccer style kicking was getting vogue, and I was talked into kicking my senior year in high school. Can't imagine, it actually wasn't very difficult to do. Uh, kicking, don't tell anybody, is actually quite easy if you kick a soccer ball. 
and I kicked my senior year. We didn't have a very good team, and so I had a lot of chances to kick. And the next thing you know, I had all these actually scholarship opportunities to go to USC and Cal and Stanford and San Diego State. And when I presented to my dad, who was an immigrant from Germany and who raised us actually without a television, we didn't have a television until I was a junior in high school, if you can imagine that. Finally talked to him because the Olympics were being shown, we wanted to watch him. Uh, so we didn't grow up watching football of any kind. And when I was presented the opportunity to go to college on a scholarship, he goes, well, why would you do that? That's not why you go to college. You want to study. And he was right. And I didn't know if I was good or not. And so I actually chose UC Davis, where I wanted to study zoology. I had a passion for wildlife. Uh, I'd spent a summer, interestingly, right after my senior year in high school, living in South Africa, working on a game reserve where they saved the white rhino. Uh, so my passion was wildlife. And so I went to Davis, didn't think about football, didn't know if they had a football team. And I'm there a week when I get a call from the head football coach who essentially says, why did you offer the football team? And when I said, I didn't know you had one and I wasn't that interested, he talked me into playing football in college and ultimately it changed my life. And when I finished, I was all set to go to graduate school. I had a chance to go to Cornell Graduate School and I get drafted. I get drafted in the NFL. Now, don't tell anybody, I was the last player drafted, so not a big deal. But the day I got drafted, my dad, who was, as I mentioned, totally clueless to this whole thing, uh, got a call from one of his colleagues who said, Dr. B, I heard Rolf was drafted, congratulations. My dad's on the other end of the line going, drafted? I thought the war was over, you mean they're still drafting people? So we had a lot to learn. He had a lot to learn and he was horrified. They're going to pay you to kick a football. Well, as luck would have it, I was actually, I ended up in San Diego and played here in front of our hometown. When I joined the team, the charges were not very good. Um, they, the year before I got here, they were two and 12. They were the worst team in football. And, uh, but they had drafted a quarterback named Dan Fouts. And all of a sudden the team started to get good. And I got to be part of that. What we didn't realize, none of us realized, was that we were playing on an historic team. Our offense would redefine offensive football. It was driven by these players. Dan Fouts was our quarterback. He would become a Hall of Famer, uh, an announcer for many, many years. And Don Coriel, the man on the left, who was the architect of our offense, an extraordinary leader, uh, very talented, very creative, and we would set all kinds of records. My whole career, I would play 10 years uh, offensively. We would average more points, more yards. And as a kicker, I had a lot of chances to kick. And so suddenly I'm sort of living this dream I actually never had playing in front of my hometown. And it was extraordinary. Now this picture <clears throat> is interesting and I want you to look at it and I'm gonna come back to it. There's a man in the back of this picture who's out of focus, who I want you to remember and I'll talk to you about later. <clears throat> so my career went along until all of a sudden my second season, I got sick. I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease. I played sick, sicker. You have to understand that as a player, uh, real players, and I'm not talking about real players are getting concussed, tearing knees and shoulders and getting beaten up every day. And I was just a kicker. I mean, hardly call myself a football player. And, and there's only one kicker. So you, you kind of keep your head down. Well, my symptoms were bad, you know, abdominal crampiness, bloody diarrhea, nothing like what my teammates were going through. So I kind of kept my head down and continued to play. Unfortunately, kicking is more technique and timing than it is strength and bronze. So I could actually continue to do my job. And I did, and actually did it quite well. If you look back at the history of my career, that was my second season, although I was getting sicker and sicker, weaker and weaker it ultimately would be one of the best statistical seasons of my career. Now, as my illness progressed though, I got sicker and sicker and ultimately couldn't eat anymore. I was put on TPN for the last month of the season. We would play the game on Sunday. Sunday night, they put me in a hospital. They put a central line in my neck. I'd be there all week. They would take it out on Saturday. I'd go spend the night with the team Saturday night. Sunday, play the game. Sunday night, back in the hospital, another TPN line there all week. And so for the last month of the season, I didn't eat. Um, but I finished, actually, as I suggested, with one of the best uh, seasons of my career. 
that off season, I tried everything I could to convince myself I was getting better. I tried every uh, traditional therapy, although back in 1979, there were not good ones, 78. Uh, I changed I changed my diet. I, I, I did acupuncture. I did biofeedback. I did everything to try to get rid of the Crohn's disease that I was diagnosed as having. Convinced myself I was getting better. Came back my third season. And in the opening game against Seattle, I kicked four field goals. Now, we're preseason picks to go deep in the playoffs. In the, in the locker room after the game, everybody's celebrating. We're on our way. We've taken step one of 16 steps. And I'm sitting in front of my locker crying. I'm in such pain. It's like somebody has a knife stuck in my abdomen. And every time I move, it turns. And in my mind, I'm going, there is no way I'm going to survive 15 more games. I have no idea what to do. So I continue to kick, continue to try. And I play three more games. And then in a game flying home from New England, I actually collapse on the team plane. I spike a fever. I don't know it at the time, but my colon is starting to perforate. They land the plane in San Diego. My dad picks me up. Mom and dad take me to the hospital. I will have surgery. There were complications in the surgery and I have a second surgery six days later, and I wake up in the same hospital where my dad was working, 65 pounds below my playing weight with two ostomy bags on my side, septic, and my physicians, my dad's colleagues, telling him, we're not sure Rolf's gonna survive the night. And the truth is I shouldn't have. I had a near-death experience that night, and I survived the night. And then the next night, and the next night, and I would spend five and a half weeks in the ICU with the doctor staying ahead of my infection and ultimately two more weeks in the hospital and, then, and, and survive. Now I'm 24 years old. I have two ostomy bags on my side. My abdomen is sewn up in the middle with wire sutures. And I remember getting taken home by mom and she did something very smart. She didn't take me right home. I was going to go spend, spend time with my parents. She took me to this place. And if you've ever been to San Diego, specifically La Jolla, you will recognize this as the cove. There's a little boardwalk around this gorgeous part of our coastline where when you go there, you, you hear the seagulls, you smell the salt air, you feel the sun. And for me, two months in the hospital, this is what I was exposed to on my way home. I remember just breaking down, so excited that I was alive, but convinced that, um, or, or unconvinced that life was really worth living. After getting home and spending several weeks there, I remember looking at my mom and go, mom, tell me why I should want to live. Why? From my perspective, there's nothing in life worth living for. I love sports of all kinds. I was a skier, tennis player, scuba diver. I love the beach. I thought I'll never do that again. I have two ostomy bags on my side. I was making my living as a professional athlete. I'm going, for sure, that's over. Nobody's ever played with an ostomy bag. And I was 24, and I like girls. And I'm going, who's going to ever like me, marry me? Lord, why didn't you take my life? And he didn't take my life. And now he had to learn how to live with it. And in the process, I went through this very, very dark period where friends and teammates would come by the house and want to see me. And I would tell mom, I just, I don't want to see him. I was scared. I was angry. I was shamed. So they knock on the door. Mom and say, you know, I just didn't feel up to it. So, you know, maybe another time. And I remember, you know, thinking, feeling sorry for myself. You know, why is this happening to me? This is so unfair. I'm kind of living this dream I never had, right? I'm playing in front of my hometown and I had some success and our team was doing well. And out of the blue, my body just gives out on me. As I sat there and struggled, um, one of my friends wouldn't take no and barged his way in and sat with me and we, we cried together and he tried to console me and encourage me. And, and, he, and he gave me one thing that I'll never forget. He told me to read a book and it was this book called I'm No Hero by Charlie Plum. Charlie was one of those POWs that was shot down in Vietnam who would ultimately spend six years in these prisoner of war camps that are just so brutal, we're so brutal to our GIs that you almost can't imagine what they lived through. 
And in the process of surviving, he didn't just survive, but those kids, those guys came out changed. And in the process, he shared in his book what they did, what they had to do, how they overcame that, how they didn't just survive. And, 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 and as, he, as I read this, I go, this is me. And I began to apply the principles that he shared to my life. Things like redefine the mission. The mission was to survive here. How do you survive? You break time down into small bite-sized increments. For him, it was how do I survive the day? I got to get to tonight. Because by tonight, they're going to stop beating me. At least I have the rest of the evening. I can't worry about tomorrow. And a week from now is like an eternity away. The second thing they talked about is setting these small achievable goals. He shares in his book, for him, it was to do, you know, 150 push-ups, 300 sit-ups, to walk back and forth in his eight-foot self 50 times a day, then to sit and memorize the name of everybody in the, in the camp in case he ever got released. He could tell people who was there. Well, I was an athlete. I was used to doing three sets of 10, running 10 hundreds, kicking 30, whatever it was. So I set my own small achievable goals. For me, it was to get out of bed, something that was hard for me to do. My dad had to tie a rope to the bottom of my bed. I had no abdominal to lever my legs, legs over the side. And then it was to walk to the mailbox and back. And the next day, walk two mailboxes. And pretty soon, I'm shuffling to the end of the street, which is not a big accomplishment. In California, if you've ever lived out here, the houses are very close. You sneeze here, five houses down, they go, God bless you. So, but it was an accomplishment. And for me, that was important. The next thing they talked about, which was really important for me, was to learn to accept help from others. We grew up in a society that says you got to do it all by yourself. Can't lean on others, can't show weakness. Well, that's, that doesn't work. Anybody that's gone through a hard time knows the value of other people coming alongside, lifting your arms, helping along the way. I need to do that. In the process, he talks about in the book, they discovered this indomitable spirit that I believe God's gifted each one of us with, where we have greater courage, greater creativity, greater ability to persevere than we ever thought we had. But most of us never get tested. We kind of drive between the guardrails of life, if you will. We maybe bounce off the side, hit a bump. But it's not until you crash figuratively in the ditch with life, one of life's most challenging circumstances, whatever it is. It might be health, it might be a bad divorce, it might be a bankruptcy, loss of a job, whatever, where you end up in this ditch and go, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, where do we go from here? It's there that you get to discover what it's really all about. And in the process, you come back changed. Those guys in those POW's pants came back changed, fundamentally changed. I will tell a story later on of Charlie coming back, starting to speak and sharing those principles that I share with you today. They were actually recorded in this book, Upside. This guy, Jim Rennan, went out and he interviewed over 250 people who had devastating circumstances, loss of a leg, becoming a quadriplegic, um, going through an unbelievably difficult uh, illness, terrible spousal breakup, horrible divorce. Some of the things that you just, you go, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, how do they survive? And in the process, he learned sometimes these traumas absolutely bury people. But some, and a huge percentage, actually get changed to where they wouldn't change what they learned and how they changed for their previous circumstance. Almost unimaginable, but that's me. I wouldn't trade what I have gone through, even though it was four major abdominal surgeries, pain, frustration, humiliation, anger, disappointment, for how it changed me. And my guess is that many of you in the audience feel the same way, but you could never know that going through it. You're just trying to figure out how to get to tonight. And we ask the question, why? Why is this happening? It isn't fair. Yes, it isn't fair. And life isn't fair. The question, though, needs to change. Not why, but what now? If you think about it, it always involves a decision. You can encourage, educate patients all you want, but ultimately the the decision will be up to them. The patient has to choose, do I want to stay bitter or do I want to get better? Now, I will tell you personally, I stayed bitter for a long time. I was angry, scared. I was 24 years old, living the dream, loving life. Our team was good. Why? 
after realizing that gets you nowhere and frankly nobody cares and at the end of the day it's just it's it's not productive i learned to accept the situation and then now what and where do i go from here and in the process of changing that decision affected everything people wanted to come along tie they wanted to encourage me the strength coach took me under his wing nursed me back to health and as i got stronger he asked me one day, do you think you can kick again? I said, I have no idea if the bags will stay on. The next thing I know, we're out there in the practice field and I'm actually crushing the ball. And I go, oh my gosh, maybe I can play. So I remember calling a meeting with the owner of our team and saying, listen, would you, I, I know you, you're gonna go to the playoffs, the Chargers are gonna go to the playoffs again. Will you allow me the opportunity just to try out? No special dispensation just try out to try to earn my job back. There'd been a lot of public support for me. A blood drive was created that would ultimately run for 36 years. And every year for 36 years, be the largest single blood drive in the history of the US. In fact, it's in the book, in this book of world records. Our city was in love with our team. And I was a person sick and the city rallied around me. I'll never forget, I'll bring tears to my eyes. But I said, you need a kicker, not just someone that people care about because they were charged. Will you try out? And he could have said, you know, Rolf, it's been great. The city loves you. But there are a hundred people in line, none of whom have ostomies. I think we'll go with one of them. But he didn't. He said, Rolf, if you can convince the medical staff that you can protect yourself, yes, go talk to Coach. I'd love to have you try out. The next thing we know, I'm trying out. And I make the team again. I get a second chance. I get a second chance to play and I would play seven more seasons. And a year later, I would be involved in what is now known as the Epic in Miami. One of the greatest football players ever, get, ever play, uh, played in the history of the NFL. And I would have a critical role. I would miss a kick in overtime. The kicker never gets a second chance in overtime. And I got a second chance and we won the game. That game became like a metaphor for my life a life of second chances that only come about when you are willing to risk it and go for it. I have a new friend. I just met him eight months ago. This little kid's named Mason. He's about nine years old, diagnosed with Crohn's disease, just like me, right in the middle of COVID. He was at Children's Hospital on TPN for six or eight weeks. His parents, because of COVID, were not allowed to visit him at the same time. So one would visit him, the other would be sleeping in the car for six weeks. Then they would rotate four or five times a day. So they would each get a chance to see Mason. And Mason could have folded. He's a kid, this isn't fair. You know what he did? When he got out of the hospital, he turned that situation and he became a fundraiser for the Crohn's and Clays Foundation, making candles, selling them, letting people know about the journey he's been on. He was an unbelievable inspiration. This man, somebody we recognize, is Bill Walton, a great friend, 36 orthopedic surgeries. Ultimately, he had back issues from a broken back playing basketball that quite literally took every part of his life away. Couldn't travel anymore, couldn't speak, couldn't broadcast for ESPN. Submits to surgery. I find out about it. I get to encourage him, uh, bring him into a program that our company created called The Better Way Back help him get back on his feet. And he is now the most grateful person in the world and is so thankful for what he went through. Extraordinary story. You'll recognize this guy, Drew Brees, another good friend, local guy, had everything going for him. And then the last game of the season, the last year of his contract as a San Diego Charger, he gets hit, fumbles the ball, goes to reach for it. And in reaching for it, a lineman lands on his shoulder and absolutely crushes his shoulder. He has major surgery. Everybody thinks his career is over. He gets cut from the Chargers. Devastated. A great player. He ends up going to New Orleans, a city that had just gone through Katrina. Devastated the city. And together, he helps resurrect the Saints and New Orleans. Nobody could have written the script. Nobody could have understood how that illness would ultimately change his life and the lives of thousands of people in New Orleans because he didn't give up. Then there's this guy, another local guy. This is Jeremy Ponsonneau and his dad. 
Jeremy was a high school golfer, really good golfer, goes to San Diego State and in his sophomore year, in two months, becomes fundamentally blind. Blind, functionally blind, can't see. He's devastated. Goes to his dad, he goes, dad, I, I, wanna, I, I don't wanna live, I, this is unbelievable. Dad goes, well, why don't we go play golf again? So we love golf. He goes, dad, I, I love golf, but I hate slow golf. And I can't imagine anybody slower than a blind golfer. So his dad says, come on, just give it a try. So he goes out to go, one time we're gonna try. He goes out there and he falls in love, but he needs his dad to guide him. Here his dad's guiding him. They give a yardage, they pick a club, his dad helps line him up and he swings. Today, Jeremy is an eight time national blind golf champion. Unbelievable story. Spends his time motivated and encouraging others, talking about the need for interdependence. He's totally reliant on his dad. He just got married. They just had a kid. He has an extraordinary life, but the decision was up to him. Do I give up or do I keep going? And he chose to keep going. Then there's this man. This is Charlie Plum. He's the one I was telling you about. The, the, the fighter, the, the Air Force fight, Navy pilot that flew off the Kitty Hawk, 47 missions, 46 successful, the last one five days before he's gonna get let go. He gets shot down, spends six months in the POW camps. I mentioned that when he was done and released, <clears throat> he started to speak and I had the privilege of hearing him. And now I've met him several times and consider him absolutely one of my heroes. He tells a story I wanna share with you. It's relevant to what you all are going through. He tells a story of speaking at a big conference and <clears throat> after the conference, having lunch by himself <clears throat> in the hotel lunchroom restaurant. And as he's sitting there, he notices a guy that kind of keeps looking at him. He's kind of peering around the corner. Finally, 10 minutes into it, the guy comes over and he goes, I know you. You're Charlie Plum. Charlie goes, yeah. You, you were an aviator, right? You flew off the Kitty Hawk. Goes, yeah. 47 missions. Well, 46, 47 didn't go well. He goes, right, you're right. You were shot down, right? Yeah, shot down, parachuted, landed in a rice field and captured six years in the pit. But the parachute worked, right? Yeah, the parachute worked. It landed six, six years. But the parachute worked, right? Charlie goes, yeah, the parachute. Why, why are you asking? The guy goes, I'm the guy that packed your parachute. Nice to meet you. And he walks away. And Charlie tells a story of dropping to his knees, thinking, oh my gosh, how many times did I walk on the deck of that carrier with my helmet in hand and everybody salute me as I walk by because I was the man. I was Charlie Plum, one of the most decorated aviators in the Vietnam War. Never once thinking about who put air in the plane of my tires of my plane or bullets or bombs on the wings of my plane and certainly never thinking about the guy three holds below in the bowels of the ship packing my parachute he vows that day never to forget the parachute packers in his life i'm going to leave you with this thought who are the parachute packers in your life there are a lot in this audience right now the only foundation you have been the people that have reached out to others who are having to live on enteral parental nutrition, who are scared to death. How can they do that? How will it impact the rest of their life? They don't know. They need somebody like you to tell them. It might be your nurse, it might be a doctor, it might be a high school teacher, someone that saw something you did in a few years. It might be a coach like mine that saw something in me that I didn't see in myself and changed my life. I wanna thank you for what you're doing. I want you to realize you have a purpose, a real purpose. And the illness, the trial, whatever you've gone through can turn into a great blessing if you give it a chance. Don't choose bitter, choose better. And in the road to better, you will find an extraordinary life. And I hope, in fact, your life is like mine, perhaps a bad chapter in an amazing story. Good luck and thank you for having me.